We are a planet in crisis. This is very clear. Everyone knows the list of challenges that we're facing. Expanding world population, unchecked industrial pollution, escalating climate disruptions, increasing drought with the associated forest fires, warmer oceans with stronger hurricanes, rising sea levels, collapsing water tables, species extinction, fished out oceans, extreme economic inequality, unprecedented refugee migrations, unstable interlocked national economies, cities and nations going bankrupt, stockpiled weapons we dare not use, and no, in, no end in sight. It's not an extreme statement to say that we are a planet on fire. If you subtract a few from this list or add a few, cumulatively, the list is overwhelming. What I would like to do today is share a perspective on the world crisis that we are entering and will continue to deepen over the years ahead. On the basis of the perspectives that were given me or the teachings that I received during my psychedelic experiences that I report in LSD in the Mind of the Universe. But first, let me give a little bit of background just to my work to set the stage for what, for the visions, the sharing of the visions that I'm going to draw from that work. Let me move this over to the side here. Okay. Okay. So the work I'm, the visions I'm just sharing today come from my work, Diamonds from Heaven, or LSD in the Mind of the Universe. Now my lineage, my psychedelic lineage, is squarely in the tradition of Stan Groff. It was his early writing, his books published in 76 and 80, that were the foundation of my work, which determined the methodology that I used in working with psychedelics. As you know, those of you who know Stan's work, his work differentiates very clearly between two different modes of working with psychedelics. Low-dose psycholytic therapy, which is designed to uncover the layers of the unconscious slowly, gradually, with therapeutic focus. And the second method, a very different method, psychedelic therapy, working with high doses. Here the goal was less to heal than to trigger a near-death experience that would give terminal patients, terminal cancer patients, an experience of where they were going when they died to trigger a near-death episode experience and therefore to relieve death anxiety. What I chose to do in my work was to work with very high doses. I saw that if this could be done safely a few times, it could be done safely more than a few times. And what I did, as Janet mentioned, was I worked did 73 high-dose LSD sessions over 20 years, between 1979 and 1999. At the end of, my end of my journey, I realized that I had gone places and had experiences that were not covered in the descriptions of the early psychedelic therapy, so I coined the term psychedelic exploration to describe this protocol. It's the protocol of working therapeutically, meaning in complete isolation with eye shades, headphones, a sitter, carefully protected, totally protected from the world, isolated, and then going very, very deep. The difference between psychedelic therapy and psychedelic exploration is the number of sessions, the high number of sessions used. Now, though the method was extreme, 500 to 600 micrograms is a very high dose of LSD, and I do not recommend this protocol. Honestly, I don't today. There were circumstances in my world that allowed this work to be very grounded. Through all these 20 years of work, I followed the same protocol, the exact same set and setting in all the work, the same sitter using the same substance at the same dose level, even in the same location in Northeast Ohio, and using the same recording process. By stabilizing all these variables, I think it created a very, very strong platform that allowed me to generate particularly clear access to the deep consciousness of the universe in this work, entering into deeper and deeper states of consciousness and digesting it as carefully and as thoroughly as I could. 
I kept track of all my sessions, taking careful note of their dates as I went through. I made a detailed record of each session within 24 hours after the session uh, was over. When you work in a sustained fashion with this powerful uh, a psychedelic, a high doses of LSD, you go through not one death and rebirth, but you go through a series of deaths and rebirths. In this image, the drop below the line represents our time-space identity, our egoic identity. And that first turning of the circle represents the process of ego death, the first death and rebirth, the loss of one's identity as a physical human being and one's first entry into spiritual reality. The subsequent circles represent re repetitions of the death and rebirth process as one enters deeper and deeper levels of the vast expanse of spiritual reality. I follow Stan in adopting his vocabulary to describe these states as the psychic level of transpersonal experience, the subtle level, and the causal level. I have no vested interest in the cosmology that goes with this, but it's simply the principle that repeating the process of surrender leads to deeper and deeper encounters with, well, leads to encounters with deeper structures of existence. Now let me give a different image for this. LSD is sometimes likened to a nuclear bomb of the psyche, which was the nuclear bomb being developed in the same decade that LSD was developed. When you do a sustained course of a very intense psychotherapeutic process, it sets in motion a tremendous catalytic energy that is sustained over a period of years. So the, the sessions get deeper and deeper and deeper in a sustained fashion. And it's not unlike a nuclear bomb in this case, which reveals as the explosion continues deeper levels of the atmosphere. These levels of the atmosphere were always there, but they had been previously invisible. And now the force of this nuclear explosion brings them into our visual awareness. Now this is just an analogy, but something like this also happens in sustained psychedelic work. The deeper you go, if you go in a very sustained fashion, you don't simply start over at the beginning of every session. But one session starts where the subsequent session stopped and you go deeper and deeper and eventually enter discrete levels of consciousness which have their own discrete rules and you acclimate to these levels of consciousness and learn how to become consciously aware at these deep levels. But we're not talking about, of course, nuclear bombs here. We're talking about entering the mind of the universe entering the great expanse of the consciousness, which is the consciousness, well, how do we describe this consciousness? Some would describe it as God or the divine. I would prefer or like to call it the mind of the universe, the mind of the cosmos. So in my personal journey into this mind, into this vast consciousness which holds all of existence, I went through multiple layers, experiencing deaths and rebirth on this journey. So I would differentiate five basic core levels of reality that I was working with in my sessions. The first took place at the level of my personal mind, one's personal unconscious. The second at the level of the species mind. The third at the level of archetypal mind the fourth at the level of causal oneness, and the fifth at the level of what I call the diamond luminosity, which is the source of the name diamonds from heaven. So let me very briefly just touch in on the chapters of the book to correlate them with this model. At the level of personal mind, there is a chapter called Cross Crossing the Boundary of Birth and Death. This is about what Stan calls crossing the perinatal level of consciousness. We get into time and space by being born. We leave by dying. 
When consciousness is expanding beyond physical reality, one enters a very complex domain where one's experience of having gotten here by birth and leaving by death get intertwined in a complex fashion. One goes through horrendous existential crises as one enters into um, a process which culminates in ego death and entry into spiritual reality. At the level of species mind, there are actually three chapters in the book pertaining to this level of the work. The first is the ocean of suffering. The fifth is deep time in the soul. And the sixth is initiation into the universe. Now I'm skipping some of the chapters in the book, as you can see. There's an introductory methodology chapter. And there's a chapter three where I give a typical session day. But these are the chapters having to do with the content of the visionary experiences it opened. When I entered the ocean of suffer suffering, I entered two years of work in which I engaged vast, vast stores of suffering. I experienced myself to become thousands of human beings spread over thousands of years, experienced great rage and, and violence and abuse on a collective scale. Eventually I came to the conclusion that this work was not about healing my personal psyche or deepening my personal ego death, that the intelligence of the universe was using my sessions to, being, to bring some type of therapeutic release to the collective unconscious of my species, the collective unconscious of my family. And I go into this at, at great length in the book. Deep time in the soul was my first entry into what I call deep time, which is a mode of time which lies outside linear time and space. It's not eternity, it's not timelessness, but it's a different modality of temporal consciousness. In this chapter, for a year and seven sessions, I experienced my complete life start to finish as a simultaneous whole. It was both ahead of me, yet to be lived, and yet, from another perspective, it already had been lived, and I could see it in its entirety. The experience of deep time deepened in the next chapter, Initiation in the Universe, where the universe took me far beyond my personal, uh, my personal concerns and took me into a series of instructions and initiations into the functioning of the universe. And it's here that the story that I'm going to be telling today began in the middle of this work. Entering archetypal, the level of archetypal mind is described in the chapter, The Greater Real of Archetypal Reality. Entering into a domain which was at the one hand, uh, lies beyond the species mind, engaging the archetypal forces which are responsible for creating time and space, and for the emergence of the forms that come forward inside time and space. Entering into the level of causal oneness where the world ceases to operate in parts, even the very large parts of archetypal re reality, but the parts become the reality, the parts, the parts dissolve into the universe experienced as a single organic whole, a single consciousness, dissolving all the boundaries between beings, all the boundaries between levels, and one can experience the universe, or I experience the universe, as a single, living, pulsing, throbbing singularity, a oneness that underlies all differentiation. The Diamond Luminosity story is told in chapter 10. It reflects four years of work and 26 sessions during which I entered the state of diamond luminosity only four times. The remaining sessions during this four year period were spent in very intense cleansing as my system worked to acclimate the enormously powerful energies that were present in these very, very pure states of consciousness what I call the diamond luminosity, what Buddhism calls Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality. 
And after that, the final year of visions, the final vision, four sessions, one year of work. But the missing chapter here is a chapter I want to talk about today. It is the birth of the future human. And this is a story which completely surprised me in my work because when I began this work, I thought this work was about personal healing or personal enlightenment or some type of personal transformation. And yet my work seems to have been profoundly connected to the work that our species is doing in history to the collective purification processes and the collective transformational processes. So in this chapter, The Birth of the Future Human, I summarize the teachings that were given to me over a, about a 15 year period. It started in session 22 in the initiation into the universe material. It continued up through the greater real of archetype of reality and the benediction of blessings. It actually also continued into the final vision material and session 70 gave me one final installment in the vision of what is happening at our time in history. So this is the material I'd like to talk about today. And just to give you a quick preview of where we're going, in the birth of the future human material, I discuss two different bodies of visions. The first I call the visions of awakening or a series of visions that I received between 1991 and 1994 over about a dozen sessions. I divided them into six areas, uh, six discrete visionary themes. I'll come back to that in a second. The second installment is one particular session that dates from 1995 that I call the Great Awakening. Now, I'm about to turn off the PowerPoint, but just to give you a quick preview of the categories where we're going, the six themes of the visions of awakening are divine love, all humanity, a guiding intelligence, our species as a single being, collective purification, and the future human. The Great Awakening chapter is a story of one day when I was taken deep into the future and there experienced the death and rebirth of humanity. So that's where we're going. Let me close this down. All right, and shine so come back to here. Ah, get me back to Zoom. I'm trying to get back to my Zoom page. Okay, so let me stop. Ah, there we go. Good. All right. Thank you for your patience, everybody. What I would like to do is share these visions with you today. And I'd like to take a chance, do something a little different. I could talk about the visions, or I could try to share the visions in a deeper, more experientially uh, oriented way. And that's what I'd like to try to do today. I'd like to try to share these visions in a way that would invite you to hear them at a deeper level than simply my talking about them. What I suggest that we do is a little experiential exercise. Uh, I would invite you to sit back and relax and close your eyes while I read a, conden a condensed version of these visions to share them with you as I actually recorded them myself. My sense is that the spoken word has a, an initiatory power that simply describing about things or talking about things don't have. And I'd like to share these visions with you in a more direct and straightforward manner. So I'd suggest 
to sort of detach from your computer screen. There's nothing going to be interesting here except me reading some of these visions for several minutes. Uh, and I invite you to listen to them with a deep heart, uh, with a deep receptivity. I'm not going to put these visions in context. I would just simply remind you that there was a great price to be paid for receiving these visions, for where these were taken. And when I say visions, I don't mean things that I have seen. When one learns at this level, one learns by becoming. So you actually must become the reality that you are seeing in order to have deep knowledge of it. And I know that these ex visions will sound perhaps extreme. Uh, they will sound uh, exotic. Um, I would just remind you of the context, that these are visionary statements that come out of years and years of sustained psychedelic work. So, let's begin. First, the divine love, the theme of divine love. <clears throat> this was in the early initiation in the universe material. And I was taken back to the beginning of creation, and there I experienced creation as an act of supreme love. I was overwhelmed by the most extraordinary cosmic love coming at me from every direction. It was a love unlike anything I had ever known before. And to awaken to this love was to remember a primordial decision that I had somehow participated in. All of us had voluntarily chosen to be part of the evolutionary process of creation. And creation was motivated, was driven, by a cosmic love. I then experienced all the suffering that humanity had endured throughout history as taking place inside this love. I realized that all the suffering inherent in evolution was noble beyond words. It was all part of a cosmic plan that we had entered into freely. However unconscious of this fact, we have become along the way. The nobility of great suffering voluntarily shouldered in the name of divine love, of suffering that would stretch across millions of years, suffering that would become so inscrutable that it would be used as evidence that the universe was devoid of compassion. This was the nobility of humanity's gift to the creative intelligence of our universe. This was an important vision because it set the context for all the visions that followed. And what it says is, no matter what is coming forward in history, no matter how hard the times are that we are entering, it is all taking place in the context of the divine love that inspired creation and our love to participate and our free choice to participate in creation in response to this divine love. The second vision, all of humanity. Out of the th seething desires of history, out of all the violent conflicts and the schemings of individuals and nations, there was now driving forward a new awareness in human consciousness. Its birth in us is no less difficult or violent than the birth of a new continent. It drives upward from the floor of our being, requiring a transposition of everything that has gone before to make room for its new organizational patterns. The great difficulty I have is describing the enormity of what is being birthed. The true focus of this creative process is not individuals, but all humanity. It is actually trying to awaken the entire species. What is emerging is a consciousness of unprecedented proportions, the entire human family integrated in a unified field of awareness, the species reconnected with its fundamental nature, our thoughts tuned to source consciousness, 
the scale of what I was witnessing took my breath away. This was a jarring expansion of my horizon because coming out of the religious traditions and spiritual learnings that I had internalized, which really focused on the transformation, awakening of an individual, of all individuals, this showed me that underneath that, there was a deeper process taking place and that the creative intelligence of the universe was working to awaken the entire species. The third vision, guiding intelligence. <clears throat> I saw humanity climbing out of a steep valley and just ahead on the other side of the mountain was a brilliant sun-drenched world that was about to break over us. The time frame was enormous after millions of years of struggle and ascent, we were poised on the brink of a sunrise that would forever change the conditions of life on this planet. All current structures would quickly become irrelevant. All truths would quickly be rendered passé. Truly, a new epoch was dawning. The lives of everyone living in this pivotal time in history we're helping to bring this global shift about. As I witnessed this scene, I saw that though we did not know the deep future at a personal level, there was a more encompassing level of consciousness that could see it very clearly. This was a deeply moving and clarifying experience for me. Individually, we humans could not see what was coming and so did not understand why things are the way they are. Yet isolated from the future, the present makes absolutely no sense. To be ignorant of what is being built would be to be functionally blind, and our species is not blind. There is an intelligence within it, guiding it, an intelligence that knows the future and is preparing us for it as systematically as we prepare our homes for the change of seasons. <clears throat> the fourth vision, our species as a single being. I was taken deeper into the unified field of existence and experienced the dynamics of humanity's awakening as movements being initiated and orchestrated by a single integrating intelligence. I experienced the evolution of our species as the systematic growth of a single organism, a unified being that all of us are part of. The subtlety of the cooperation of the parts with the whole was extraordinary. To experience the incredible diversity of our species as a single unified field made many events clearer. New patterns sprang into view and the patterns made transparent sense. Nothing in our theological or philosophical systems does justice to these facts. What I then saw was that the unified field of humanity was moving decisively and precipitously to become more aware of itself. Whereas previously it had existed as an extended fabric, largely unconscious of itself. Now it was waking itself up. Visually, this took the form of energy coming together in swift contractive spasms that created bright flashes of awareness. I repeatedly saw extended webs of energy suddenly contract and explode in brilliant flashes. In the past, these flashes had been swallowed by the inertia of the collective psyche and had not endured. Now, however, the flashes were beginning to hold their own and to connect with other flashes occurring around the planet. And as I trace the Black Lives Matter movement, I think of this vision. I think of the contraction and the explosion of light 
which is throwing light on these dark shadows in our culture. <clears throat> the fifth vision, collective purification. When an organism is called on from within to become more conscious, it must first cleanse itself of the psychological byproducts of living at its lower level of awareness. It must bring forward the residue of its past and purge that residue from its system in order to lay the foundation for a more refined level of operation. Our species was doing this in a wholesale manner and with great determination by crystallizing within itself generations that embody our toxic legacy. It was the coordinated exercise of the self-evolution of the species as a whole. The poisons of humanity's past were being brought to the surface in us, and by transforming these poisons in our individual lives, we were making it possible for divine awareness to enter more deeply into future generations. We had volunteered for this role for both our personal good and the collective good. I saw that this century formed a watershed into which the karmic streams of history were flowing and that this, as this process came to fruition, the future condition of our species would be beyond anything we might project from our current state of fragmentation. The present form of humanity is transitional. We are cells in a superorganism intent on rapid change. Our very constitution, the form of our species, is a stage in a longer evolutionary journey. And finally, the sixth vision, the vision of the future human. At one point, I was given a brief experience of the future human we are becoming. I was carried deep into the distant future and allowed to experience what will be a, the abiding state of humanity at that time. What a magnificent being. Just touching it filled me with rapture, calm, and sheer delight. It felt clear, warm, and whole. There was an abiding sense of oneness that went deeper than just the feeling of being interconnected. It was a feeling of being truly one underneath the diversity of life. Such expansiveness, such breadth of being, it was fully embodied spiritual realization, the tantric awakening of our entire species spirit and matter in perfect balance. This penetrating glimpse transfixed me. Its beauty, grandeur, and simplicity pierced my heart. So for these four years, in the background of these many sessions, these messages kept coming forward, kept presenting themselves, kept filling in the blanks in the background, helped me understand what was taking place in history at the deeper level, that we were on the cusp of this profound spiritual awakening, that we were, had entered into this voluntarily, and that everything that was happening to us was all part of a larger cosmic plan, which was all part of the love that the creative intelligence would share with us in the act of creation itself. The net result of these experiences, though they gave me a sense of what was happening, they helped me understand why things were unfolding the way they were. It helped me understand why the ocean of suffering, what was taking place in these collective purification processes. It focused me on the question, how? How can the entire species be awakened? What will it actually take for humanity 
to make this quantum jump in its awareness. The visions of awakening showed me that this was the project of history, but nowhere did it give me any idea how nature, how the creative intelligence of the universe was actually going to pull this off. Meanwhile, my psychedelic journey continued. I had been going through the benediction of blessings. I entered into the diamond luminosity work. I had entered into the diamond luminosity twice with two more to come down the road. About once a year, I was entering into the ecstatic bliss of the diamond luminosity. And then right in the middle of that sequence, when I was expecting to be taken again into the diamond luminosity, instead, I was taken into the death and rebirth of the human species. I would emphasize that this experience completely introduced new categories for me because there was absolutely nothing personal about the state I was in, not even the residual personal of individual ecstatic awakening. Instead, there was a wholeness about it that was species-wide. Its movement was the movement of my species. As often happens in these sessions, experience preceded understanding, and I simply began to experience new things, and only slowly did I get my bearings on what I was experiencing. So this is the Great Awakening session that took place in 1995. After a long personal cleansing process and a long introduction, I dissolved into the species mind completely and there had the following experiences. The core scenario. In a field of relative calm, a small anxiety began to grow. Slowly, people were looking up and becoming alarmed. Humanity was waking up in alarm to events that had overtaken it. Conditions got worse and worse. People became more and more frightened as the danger increased, forcing them to let go of their assumptions at deeper levels. There was less and less for people to hold on to, fewer givens that they could assume how they would live, where they would live, what they would do for a living, how society was organized, what could be possessed. The world as they knew it was falling apart. Decades were compressed into minutes and I felt the people's fear deepen as they lost more and more of what they considered the normal and necessary structures of their world. Step by step, events were forcing a rapid reassessment of everything in their lives. The events that had overtaken Earth were of such scope that no one could insulate themselves from them. The level of alarm grew in the species field until eventually everyone was forced into the melting pot of mere survival. We were all in this together. Families were torn apart parents from their children, children from each other. Life as we had known it was shattered at the core. We were reduced to simply trying to survive. For a time, it looked as though we would all be killed. But just when the storm was at its peak, the worst of it passed and the danger slowly subsided. Though many had died, Many were still alive. <clears throat> As the survivors began to find each other, new social units began to form. Parents and children from different families joined to form new types of families. Everywhere, new social institutions sprang into being that reflected our new reality, new ways of thinking, new values that we had discovered within ourselves during the crisis. Every aspect of life was marked 
by new priorities, new perceptions of the good, new truths. These new social forms reflected new states of awareness that seemed to spread throughout humanity like a positive contagion. These no, new social forms then fed back into the system to elicit still newer states of awareness in the people. And the cycle of creativity between the individual and the group spiraled. The whole system was becoming alive at new levels and this aliveness was expressing itself in previously impossible ways. It was as if the eco-crisis had triggered the myelinization of nerve cells in our species brain, allowing new and deeper levels of self-awareness to spring into being. And repeatedly, there was the message, these things will happen faster than anyone could anticipate because of the hyper arousal of the species mind. Thousands of fractal images drove this lesson home again and again, faster than anyone can anticipate. The pace of the past was irrelevant to the pace of the future. <clears throat> there were other components that were shown me over the course of my long journey. A lot of sessions were spent exploring the dynamics of reincarnation and showing me what I came to call the birth of the diamond soul, that all of our former lives eventually come together and fuse into a singularity. And in their, that fusion, there is a release, an explosion of this diamond light inside us and opening us to a completely expanded sense of identity. Ego yields to soul. The small world of the present body-mind yields to the much, much larger world of the soul that travels in and out of time effortlessly. So to summarize the core vision that came from my sessions that helped me personally understand what's happening in history now under our feet, that humanity is coming into a time of profound transformation, a shift in the collective unconscious of our species, a shift in the archetypal blueprint of humanity, and a profound awakening into oneness. But for there to be this great awakening, there must first take place a great death. We must be emptied of the old before the new can emerge. We must surrender our smallness. We must surrender the ego's constant self-cherishing with all the divisions that it brings between races, religions, classes, nations, and even species. I believe that we are entering the dark night of our collective soul. All mystics go through the dark night before awakening into the bliss of oneness, they go through the dark night, which is a time of intense purification. And now I think humanity as a whole is entering the dark night of its collective soul. It is a time of emptying, a time of intense anguish, of loss of control and breakdown, a global purification unto death that will last generations. But through this hard labor, we will give birth to something truly extraordinary. More than just a new civilization, what is emerging is something is nothing less than a new order of human beings. Through the global systems crisis, our planet is giving birth to the future human, a higher form of humanity. The diamond soul is being born in history, and we are all part of its birth. I believe that each one of us, before we incarnated, knew what we were getting into, and we consciously chose to incarnate at this time in history and in the places where we are in order to contribute to, to participate and contribute to the spiritual awakening of humanity. 
Thank you very much. And I think we have a few minutes, if we can, to handle some questions. So I'll turn this back over to Jason and Jeanette. Hi, gosh, I'm all choked up, Chris. That was beautiful, thank you. Right, let's have a look at the question. There's one question here from Katie Carr. Um, Katie, do you want to ask that question yourself? Um, Jason, can we unmute Katie? Or can I unmute? There we go. Um, I've, I've yep, Katie, there she is. I'm here. Thank you so much. It's actually two questions. I'll read them out. First, I'm intrigued in what you said. Um, massive appreciation. Um, but about the centrality of the human species in these visions. And it seems kind of anthropocentric given that we invented the concept of species anyway and I'm wondering about like the, the place of non-human life in this expanded consciousness yes and so I read the first one and then you can ask the second one how about that because okay, this is a really important question now, I have friends who have spent a great deal of time at the interface of the human species and animal species and actually immersing themselves into various animal species with various insights. And, and my work has not been like that. My work has been really focused on the human species. And I don't know why, except for one particular thing. Uh, I think the human species is the most dangerous species on the planet right now. It is our the imbalances of the human psyche which are placing the lives and well-being of the other species in peril. If we can heal and make right, make whole the human species, then the other species will be saved and they will be safe on our planet. My best understanding is that my work is really focused on the human species, not that it denies the importance of the other species, but that it's trying to basically get at the problem where it lives. And right now, the problem where it lives is inside the human heart and our insensitivity to the larger, deeper rhythms of life that we share with all the other life forms on our planet. Mm. Yeah, I, I hear that it's like the biggest potential for purification is right here with us. The essential. If the human species can be fixed, so to speak, can be wakened up, everyone mm. will be safe on the planet. If we're not saved, if we don't save ourselves and wake ourselves up, then all life forms will continue to be in danger. Mm. Beautiful, thank you. Um, the second question was, after this incredible gift of realization, it's a big question. What have you been doing with your life for the last 20 years? <laughs> Good question. Well, I spent 20 years really thinking about these sessions and trying to understand them. It takes a long time to integrate uh, experiences this deep. Uh, it turned out to be, it, much to my surprise, coming down the mountain of these visions was almost as difficult as going up the mountain. Uh, and the last chapter of the book is a chapter called Coming Off the Mountain, where I describe some of the challenges I face coming away from the visionary state, entering back into uh, the fully grounded condition. So what I've been doing is that I continue to teach. I mean, I taught for a number of years and I really couldn't talk about my psychedelic practice openly until I had retired from the university because I, I love teaching and if I had talked about let people know what I was doing uh, it would have terminated my academic career. Uh, I continue to take care of my children to shepherd them as best as one can into their adult lives. Um, I have tried to deepen my spiritual practice. I've always been a meditator, always done some form of spiritual practice, which I think is really important if you're going to enter into what I would call the path of temporary immersion, which is working with psychedelics. It's really important to have a stable uh, practice, spiritual practice, a daily practice that takes care of your body and your mind 
and helps you integrate these extreme uh, swings of energy and these extreme ideas that pour into us during a psychedelic session. So I basically, it, I've been digesting my work. I've been finishing out my life process in the middle part of my life. I retired from the university. I did a little more teaching, but basically I wrapped all that up by about 2015. It took me five years to write this book. Even though I had all the sessions beforehand, it took me five years. First, it took me a long time just to get myself in the psychological space where I would be willing to share these experiences because they are so personal. I mean, they're so deep they are so intimate they are about my relationship with the divine and it took me a long time just before i was willing to let anyone have access to such deep places within my own uh, life history uh, but spirit kept telling me no you don't have the luxury of being private uh, right now it's all oars in the water things are speeding up, people will be able to use uh, your work in order to strengthen uh, and support their own life's journey as we go into this time in history. And so it turned, it, right after I'd finished my sessions, Spirit said to me in my meditation, 20 years in, 20 years out, which meant that it would take 20 years for me to digest all the gifts that I had been given in that 20 year journey. Um, and it just so happens that uh, Diamonds from Heaven was published 20 years after I stopped my last journey. Mm. Thank you. I'm, I'm really, really grateful uh, that you started so young and have, <laughs> and have shared with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Katie. Yes, I did start young. I did this work when I was 30 to 50, and I'm now mm. 71. Mm. Thank you. Okay, um, uh, is it okay to move to the next question? Um, so this Jamie Mills, um, can, we, can we unmute Jamie Mills? And thank you, Katie, for your question. It was both questions, very good questions. Can we unmute Jamie? Um, I have done, Jamie's. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Chris, thank you for your um, heartfelt sharing. Thank you, Jamie, um, nice to meet you. As someone with children, I'm uh, and trying to hold this aspect in awareness, I often uh, struggle with the normalcy of life as well as with some awareness of what is to come. And uh, as part of that, I suppose there's the question of do you anticipate seeing more, well, seeing these changes in your lifetime? Hmm. You know, I, I want to emphasize that in my visionary work, I was never given any particulars of how, when, you know, you know how it was going to manifest. It, it's, it appeared to be a global crisis that was triggered by uh, a global climate change crisis. Uh, it seems to be, seemed to be ecologically driven that impacted uh, the political process, the economic process, our social process. But in terms of when, how specifically, no content whatsoever. I was shown that it was happening, that it would be happening. I was shown some of the collect, some of the mechanisms of the process and um, specifically how the role that the collective psyche would play in catalyzing this change underneath our feet as quickly uh, as is needed for us to survive our foolishness. Uh, I have children uh, like many of us here and um, I've been surprised frankly, with COVID-19, how quickly we have escalated into uh, a sense of global crisis, how quickly we've had the rug pulled out from under many of our feet. We've been had to uh, rearrange our lives dramatically. Uh, to me, the pandemic feels to be like an overture to a symphony. 
it starts the process. It, it's, it, it touches some of the themes of the process that we're getting into, but it is not itself the, the key crisis. It is the beginnings of a series of punctuated crises that will um, move and deepen in the years ahead. Um, and we're not powerless. In fact, how we respond in the next 10 years will be very important with how deep um, this crisis will be and will be generated. I think we're beyond the point of being able to stop it, but we're not the beyond the point of being able to influence it. During my lifetime, I expect that I am watching it begin, but I don't think I'll be watching it finish. I think that work is going to fall to my, our children and to our children's children. I suspect this will last generations because we're talking about the a pivoting of an entire planet. And this will take time. Hmm. One of the authors who has really laid out the escalating scale of the crises that we're facing is Dwayne Elgin, whose latest book, he's been a, a, an elder thinking through these issues for decades in his life. And he's just published his last book and it's called Choosing Earth. And he lays out the next five decades, decade by decade, how these crises are likely to be compounding themselves. And it's all data driven, it's, it's not visionary driven. He really does his homework thoroughly. He's been monitoring all the international forecast, crunches the numbers and gives us a, a sense of what's likely to be happening in the decades ahead. And the whole last part of the book is what can we do? What can an individual do? We don't have to simply sit, take this lying down. In fact, we don't want to simply take it lying down. We need to get up and mobilize and mobilizing at two different levels, inwardly doing our spiritual homework, confronting the shadow that we have carried into this time in history and outwardly supporting the process of healing the collective psyche and confronting the shadow that it has brought into this time in history. So there's plenty of work to be done. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, we've got a couple of minutes, if my clock is right, until quarter past. Do you want to take one more question, Chris, or, do you, or shall sure. we? Yeah? One, one more is fine. Um, so, the next question is Claudia Schwartz-Platsch. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And thank you, Jamie, for your question. Um, can we unmute Claudia? Yeah, Hi, Claudia. Hi, Chris. Uh, we met about one and a half years ago at a conference in Philadelphia. And um, yeah. yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you. And later I read your book. And yeah, I'm really fascinated with your work. So my question is, from a Christian perspective, I'm wondering whether the vision of the future human could refer to something like heaven. Because what you describe sounds a lot like the Christian descriptions of heaven, but of course, how you are describing it, it's still on earth. Yes. So I'm wondering whether there's a way we could integrate your insights with the Christian teachings and whether Christianity has ever played a role for your explorations. Certainly Christianity did play a role in my exploration. I was raised in the Deep South. I was raised in Mississippi and I was raised Catholic and I got a good shake from the Catholic Church. I, I really I have no complaints about my experience uh, being raised Catholic. And in fact, my first vocation in life was to actually be a Catholic priest. I was in the seminary for three years in high school even, and one year in college. And I, I left that behind in order to choose a different course, uh, a course with children, a course with marriage. Um, my life has been deeply influenced by all the spiritual traditions of the world. I've taught world religions for years. I consider all of them dear friends. But the two which have influenced me most deeply has been Christianity and Buddhism. Those are the ones that I've drawn most inspiration from. I think you're absolutely right. I think what we're looking at is heaven on earth. That is the vision of moving forward, that this is an embodiment of heavenly states of consciousness in our physical existence. 
Now, stepping back very quickly, I know we don't have much time, so very quickly, all the religions of the last 5,000 years have all been what I would call up and out cosmologies. The idea is that you achieve a state of salvation or spiritual awakening, and once you achieve that state, you leave. The Hindu word for enlightenment was moksha, escape, escaping time and space. I think all of these cosmologies got half of the message, but lost half of the message, hadn't gotten the second half of the message yet, and therefore they represent incomplete visions of history. Because it leaves unanswered the question, what is the purpose of time and space? What is the purpose of this magnificent universe? It's been called a veil of suffering. It's been called a place where we just want to get out of it as quickly as we can. We want to get back into the bliss of divine existence. And I understand that in the period of history that it covered. When we began to actually have experiential access to the deep, deep divine truths, naturally we would feel drawn to being there. And then we could not realize these truths here. We would want to be there. But I think the deeper truths are really coming into our awareness today. The more we understand the extreme age and how much intelligence and how much effort has been invested in unfolding this universe for 13.8 billion years and will continue to be unfolding for billions and billions and billions of years more, the more we begin to understand a different vision for humanity and that is not that our goal is to awaken and leave, but our goal is to awaken and incarnate divine consciousness here in our body, on this planet, and in this process, cooperate with taking creation into a new developmental level. Truly heaven on earth, truly fully awakened spiritual consciousness in our physical bodies. Our egoic consciousness, our present mind-body consciousness exploded into the larger consciousness of the soul, another Christian theme, but a soul textured with all of its former life history, a tremendous expansion of the human heart because we have so many relationships with so many people over so many centuries, and also an expansion of the human mind as we open more easily and more naturally into the divine consciousness that nurtures all. I think it's very, it's very compatible with Christian vision once we understand and make a couple of small adjustments. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.